Look at these two lovebirds sharing a moment together. So sweet. Hmm, no wedding ring? Um, that's disturbing. Let us out. I really just wanted this painting to be cute. Why couldn't it be cute and simple just this one time? Well, here's a painting of a puppy to make up for it. This piece is called The Awakening Conscience by William Holman Hunt. It's lovely, but if you look a little closer, things start to feel a bit off. This painting was the artist's way of influencing the apple of his eye. Oh no, sorry, I meant her. She's the apple of his eye. He was trying to influence her. But instead, by creating this painting, he unknowingly manifested his worst nightmare. We're placed in a shadowy room. Our eyes are immediately drawn to a young woman rising from a man's lap. It feels like we're peeking in on a quiet scene between two lovers. Yet while the man appears to be trying to reach out to her, she seems lost in thought her eyes fixed ahead. And if we look into the reflection of the mirror hanging on the back wall, we notice her gaze is directed toward a sun-drenched garden outside the room. Oh yeah, the room. To our modern eyes, this might look like a typical Victorian space, but if we look at it through the lens of someone living in the 1800s, it takes an unsettling turn. The furnishings would have seemed gaudy, the room excessively cluttered. The furniture, eerily pristine and unblemished, exuded a fatal newness, as remarked by one critic of the era. Which begs the question, does anyone even live here? But to a Victorian observer, the answer to this question was written all over the walls. It's clear that this is an intimate scene, since the woman's hair is down, and if she was going out, it would have been up. But in contrast to the man who wears outdoor clothing, she's partially undressed and it would have been unmistakable based on his attire that he was a wealthy man. Perhaps the couple is spending time together before he leaves for work or something, right? Wrong. Because remember, this painting is not cute. Not cute at all. Notice the man's glove carelessly tossed on the floor, giving us a clue that he has recently come in from the outdoors, not getting ready to leave. This looks like a wealthy and educated woman sitting in front of a beautiful piano, wearing fancy jewelry, books scattered about, but there's something superficial about it because the books on the table are manuals for writing that look like they've never been opened. Perhaps she can't actually read, and we can see that the man is the one playing the piano with his gloved left hand, not the woman. What's more, a closer look at the woman's left hand reveals a ring on all of her fingers except her ring finger. This woman isn't the man's wife. She's his mistress. And this room isn't for comfort. It's for convenience. This is a fake place, a holding place, like a room in a dollhouse where you store a toy for safekeeping and return to it when you feel like playing with your toy again. This painting is full of scrumptious detail and symbolism. Let's see, where should I start? The cat playing with the bird on the floor serves as a metaphor for how the woman has been caught by the man. The tangled yarn on the floor symbolizes the messy web she has found herself in. The clock on the piano is encased in glass that echoes the shape of the painting, drawing a parallel between the woman's entrapment and the golden figure trapped within the glass case. The discarded glove on the floor represents the woman's fate once the man decides he's done with her. According to art critic John Reskin, the print on the wall is of a woman who has committed adultery and is in the act of repentance. The flowers on the piano may be carnations and anemones, which are symbols of engagement and abandoned love. But perhaps the most important symbol is the ray of light in the right corner of the painting. This represents hope that redemption is still possible for the woman. And if we direct our attention to the piano, we can see that the couple is singing along to the song Oft in the Stilly Night by Thomas Moore. Moore's song describes his experience reflecting on childhood memories that flood his mind as he lies in bed at night. This painting is so vivid, it's almost as if we can imagine the string of events that occurred prior to this moment. The woman is seated on the man's lap as he plays, and while she sings the sad song, memories of her own childhood 
would resurface, and she begins to long for those simpler, more innocent times. The man continues singing as she drifts away from his embrace and toward the sun streaming in through the window. And as she does, she experiences a sudden spiritual revelation, an awakening of her conscience. But why did Hunt paint this? The tale of the fallen woman was a prevalent narrative in Victorian England, at a time when the pinnacle of a woman's virtue was her sexual innocence. This myth typically revolved around a young woman who, having lost her virginity or engaged in extramarital relations, found herself abandoned by her seducer, destitute, and eventually dead under a bridge somewhere. Given the ubiquity of this storyline, viewers would have perceived the woman in Hunt's painting as someone who had fallen from divine grace. This sentiment is echoed by art critic John Ruskin, who writes, The very hem of the poor girl's dress, at which the painter has labored so closely, thread by thread, has a story in it. If we think of how soon its pure whiteness may be soiled with dust and rain, her outcast feet failing in the street. But Hunt tweaked this narrative slightly, suggesting the possibility of redemption and moral awakening for the woman. This painting is Hunt's way of saying that God works in mysterious ways, and the girl's seducer, who is the source of her corruption, can also be the reason for her salvation. William Holman Hunt was a very religious man. In fact, the inspiration for this painting came from a Bible verse from Proverbs. As he that taketh away a garment in cold weather, so is he that singeth songs to a heavy heart, which he had written on the original frame. But the artist's religious beliefs aren't the only reason he created this painting. It's also because, for him, this was personal. The model for this painting was named Annie Miller. She was born in 1835 to a working-class family in the slums of London. Her mother died when she was a child. Her father was a war veteran who suffered from ill health, so she mainly lived with her aunt and uncle growing up. Those who knew and knew of her as a child referred to her as a street urchin, gutter rat, wild, and filthy. Hunt met Annie Miller at a pub in Chelsea when she was 16 years old, where she was already a part-time model and probably a part-time prostitute as well. But as art historian Lees Vogel points out, at this time, there wasn't really a distinction between the two. And so it goes that once Annie began modeling for Hunt, she likely became his mistress as well. Although Hunt clearly didn't outright oppose their arrangement, it made him morally squeamish. Yeah. So he decided to fix it in kind of a weird way. There's this story in Greek mythology about a sculptor named Pygmalion who has a bad experience with a woman and so he becomes disenchanted with all women. Since he thinks all women are terrible, he decides to sculpt his perfect woman. Pygmalion ends up falling in love with his own creation, and the Greek goddess Aphrodite grants his wish and brings his sculpture to life. Similar to Pygmalion, Hunt carefully curated Annie's life to make her into a lady and his ideal woman. He yanked her out of poverty, set her up with a nice place to live, good clothes, and access to schooling, with the ultimate goal that one day she would wake up and choose to be his wife. Sound familiar? Spoiler alert. It backfired. Hunt created this painting right before embarking on a two-year trip to the Holy Land. During this time, he left Annie in the care of his close friend and fellow artist, Frederick Stevens. He left her with a list of artists she was allowed to model for and those that she wasn't. He explicitly told her she couldn't model for Dante Gabriel Rossetti because he was known to be a womanizer. Despite all of his efforts, Annie decided that she would model for whomever she pleased. She even developed a relationship with Dante Gabriel Rossetti, which caused a rift between him and Hunt. Wait a minute, why does this sketch look so familiar to me? Holy sh- the man in the painting is William Holman Hunt, the artist who created the piece. Hunt was the seducer all along. He's the one who got her that room in the dollhouse. He bought her nice clothes and jewelry and arranged for her education. It's important to note that we don't know for sure if this is a self-portrait, but what do you think? So, why would Hunt paint himself in such an unflattering way? Maybe while preparing for his trip to the Holy Land, he began to feel a bit guilty for his role in their very unholy relationship. 
If it is indeed him, it would be incredibly ironic because that would mean that William Holman Hunt accidentally prophesied his worst nightmare. If we look at this painting with Hunt as the seducer, it means that Annie's conscience was awakened from Hunt. And that, my friends, is actually what happened. Let me explain. Hunt was always eager to take his relationship with Annie to the next level, but any time he proposed anything to her, she shut him down because she couldn't fathom relinquishing any control over her life. Despite their complicated relationship, Hunt and Miller did eventually get engaged, but broke it off in 1859. So maybe Annie just didn't want to get married. But this isn't the truth. Annie did want to be a wife, just not Hunt's wife. Ten years after this painting was created, she married Captain Thomas Thompson. She had two children and remained married for over 50 years until the captain died in 1916. Annie went on to live six more years before dying at the age of 90. The man who commissioned this painting was Thomas Fairburn. Upon receiving it, he was unable to bear the look of horror on the girl's face, and so he asked Hunt to soften her expression. During this repainting process, it's likely that many of Annie's features were lost. Needless to say, the face of the woman we see today is not the same face people saw when the painting was first exhibited in 1853 and likely doesn't really look that much like Annie. However, this isn't the only time Hunt painted over Annie's face. She also posed for his painting, Il Dolce Fa Niente. Years later, after Hunt had moved on and married a woman named Fanny Waugh, he got the painting out again, scraped Annie's face off completely, and repainted Fanny's face onto the painting. As it turns out, Annie's hymn wasn't soiled after all, and she didn't end up on the streets. She didn't wind up dead under a bridge somewhere. The world may have tried to seduce Annie into believing that she was a fallen woman, but she kept the fancy jewelry and tossed that narrative right out onto the streets. And that's what I call an awakened conscience.